All right, let's talk about the simple experiment today. So all of these are the terms that you have to know, just kind of make sure that you know them and each one we're gonna talk about them um, briefly today. Okay, so what are the characteristics of a true experiment? For, for, so the first thing you need to have is you need to have some sort of manipulation of the independent variable. And the second thing that you need to have is some sort of measurement for the dependent variable. And this needs to be operationalized as we have talked about uh, many times. And then you need to have at least an experimental group and a control group in a independent group's design. Now in the repeated measure design, you need to have uh, various forms of conditions, okay? And then the next one, uh, number four, is you need to have random selection and random assignment. So what is random selection? Well, random selection is um, every person in your population of interest need to have equal amount of chance of being recruited into your study, basically. And random assignment is that once you gather this pool of people, you uh, the person who gets assigned to the control group or the experimental group, you cannot assign them based on what your preference is. You have to assign them based on random uh, randomness. Okay, so which means that A and B, uh, uh, participant A and participant B, they have an equal chance of being assigned into a control group or the experimental group. And the way that you, you, we usually do this is by flipping a coin or throwing a dice, all this kind of stuff, all right? <clears throat> Now, the fifth thing that they need to have a characteristic of a true experiment is holding the conditions constant. Okay, so you have to make sure that whatever you do to the experimental group, you do exactly to the control group. Everything is exactly the same except the manipulation that you're trying to do. Okay, and this is the same as standardization. So as we talked about, standardization is having an SOP. Uh, SOP uh, to make sure that everything that you did from the beginning to the end is exactly the same way. Now let's take a look at the independent variable. Okay. Now the independent variable. Now let's talk about the levels of the independent variable. So this is the treatment that varies in amount. Okay, and these difference in amounts are called levels. So the uh, information that you have here is that say if you wanted to see the if the amount of caffeine ingested have an effect on the concentration level and of course this needs to be operationalized and then you uh, have then you can give caffeine in different amount you can have uh, no coffee one cup of coffee and, and two cups of coffee and in this, this experiment you basically have three groups of independent variable you've got no coffee one cup of coffee and two cups of coffee now let's talk, talk, let's talk about the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is the thing, as you guys know, that is being, that is the readout basically. And this is the variable that is predicted to be affected by the manipulation of the independent variable. So basically you, uh, so let's say if you wanted to see if uh, caffeine influence concentration or attention, then the way that you measure these concentration and attention level, these are the independent variable. And as we said many times before, the um, dependent variable needs to be measurable and or operationalized. Okay, so otherwise you're just looking at a construct, right? And this is something that we have talked about many, many times. Um, so uh, if you're not sure, you can go back to read your previous lectures as well. Now let's talk about manipulation check. So man man manipulation check, we all have also kind of talked about. And this is something that you want to make sure that whatever manipulation that you're intending to do, this is perceived um, by the participants. Okay, so so for instance, like if you wanted to, to know if hearing music in the background can affect people's mood, at the end experiment, you will ask the subject, did you notice that there were music playing in the background? And another example of the, man, of the manipulation check that last, week, last time we talked about, and that is the Darty and Latin smoke under the door study, right? So the manipulation in this case is that they are trying to look at whether or not uh, having an emergency, a perceived emergency, which kind of says that the building is on fire, did the participants notice that? Did, if they did not notice the smoke is coming from under the door, they then therefore this is a failed experiment. So it's, so therefore manipulation check is really, really important in when you are trying to see what is going on, whether or not your intended uh, manipulation worked or not. 
Okay, so the experimental group, as you guys know, this is the group that received the intended treatment, okay, as opposed to a control group that received no treatment. And the control group uh, is, of course, uh, now, when you think about control group, you would think that this is the group that received nothing, and this is not the case because there are various forms of controls. And so today we're going to talk about all these various forms of control. So these are the groups that receive the treatment other than the treatment received in the experimental group. Now, there are various forms of controls. So for instance, the one that we have talked about is the placebo control group. So in the and so as you guys know, the placebo effect is when people they get a, some sort of bogus treatment and then um, and they think that they're getting an effective treatment and therefore they start to behave or feel differently. Um, so so the difference in the behavior is due to the just the power of su suggestion and then this power of suggestion is very very powerful. Um, because sometimes it can convince the participants that this really is an effective treatment to the point that sometimes it even exceeds uh, effective treatment. So for people, when they are believing that this is uh, a real effective treatment, then they, they really are going to start to behave differently. So therefore, it's very important to have a placebo control in which that the researcher usually use placebo control group um, when one control one group gets the real medicine, that's the experimental group, and the other group gets the placebo with a bogus medicine to rule out the effect of the mental suggestions on uh, due to the uh, it, that that kind of results in the differences in the two groups. Okay, so for instance. Uh, let's take a look at this example, okay? Uh, so let's say if you are looking at the ingestion of coffee on reaction time, and what you're looking at the, in the blue is this is the group that uh, ingests nothing, and then the orange group is the one that ingested decaf, and then the green group is the one that ingested uh, the, the actual coffee. And you can see that their reaction time uh, is highest for the group that ingested nothing, and then and followed by the one that, that ingested decaffeinated coffee, and then followed by the one that is the ingested uh, the, the real caffeine coffee. Okay, and so you can see that this differences between this um, blue and the orange. This is the placebo effect, and as opposed to the the, the difference that is between the orange and the the green this is the placebo i'm uh, sorry this is the the real effect of treatment okay so now imagine if you do now imagine if you do not have this orange uh group that the group that ingested the caffeine in the ca uh, caffeine then what you really looking at is the difference between the blue that ingested nothing and the green that ingested a uh, coffee and then so what you'll be look, really looking at is the effect of the placebo plus the real effect of treatment now then the, the problem happens that you don't know if this difference is between the blue and the green is this due to the real effect of treatment or is this due to the effect of the placebo? So you can see that this can be a real problem. And then in the next slide, I'm going to have some more uh, example to tell you why this exactly is, a, is such a, a big problem. Okay, now let's take a look at the types of control group. Okay, so uh, there are placebo, con uh, placebo control group as we have talked about, and now there are empty control groups. So this is the subject that received nothing, right? So this is the source of bad experimentation. And then there is the positive control group in which that the subjects were given a treatment based on previous studies that are known to have an effect. So the negative control groups, these are the control groups either received no treatment, an empty control group, or the treatment that received um, like a placebo, okay? So whenever you say negative control group, these are basically saying that uh, these are the subjects that are supposed to have no, that, that receive no real treatment, okay? Now, why is having a placebo group so important? Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, this type of error. So now when you're looking at this case, you have an uh, 
empty control group and then you have an experimental group and you say that okay it seems that these two groups are significantly different from one another right because look how how different the, these are you know and then the error bars don't uh, overlap from one another and um, so basically it looks like there's physical significance right now um, but what happened if you were to include a placebo control group over here in green then you can see that uh, this differences be between the empty control group and the experimental control group is really actually due to the power of the placebo effect rather than the actual um, treatment itself because when you look at the um, the differences between the placebo group and the experimental group they're they are not significantly different from, from one another so then what happened is that if you only included the empty control group and the the experimental group if you only have two groups that are kind of comparing uh, one from the other then what you really committed is a type one error you're saying that there's really is an effect in but in reality there isn't so this is a bad source of experimentation, okay? So this type of pad pattern basically means that there is a significant effect of the placebo, however, the effect of treatment is not really there. And then the researchers would have committed a type one error if the placebo control was not put in place, okay? And now, so the example of the scenario from the previous slides, so it's the one that I kind of give you right now. So these are the researchers that were interested in seeing the effect of vitamin C on alertness. And then the empty control group received no treatment. The, the, the placebo control received a water pill and the experimental group received a vitamin C. And you can see that um, the experimental group that received vitamin C and the ones that the, the one that received the water pill really do not perform that different from one another as opposed to but but when you look at the uh, uh the the performance that they they did in the empty control group versus the placebo control group there's a significant difference from from one another so you can see that this difference is, is really due to uh, this power of suggestion and therefore they perform better in both placebo control group and experimental uh, and experimental group but they're but but uh, but the experimental group are not doing any better than the placebo con uh, control group, okay? Now, what happens if you, the placebo effect and the real effect of treatment oppose one another? Then what you have is basically, uh, you probably guessed it, then you have the likelihood of committing a type two error, okay? so. So let's imagine if you have uh, a group that received no treatment and you have another group that received a fake treatment. And then, so you got this effect that is going up, that is the placebo effect, but the real effect of the treatment actually opposes this uh, placebo effect. Then what you are actually looking at is that, is the placebo effect and the, um, the real effect of the treatment negate one another, right? And then what you, so, so the problem with the, of not having a placebo control group when you look at uh, the green part and the blue part. So if when, you, when you're looking at like the the experimental group and the empty control group, basically they are not that much different from one another. And so imagine if you do not have uh, a group that received a fake treatment, which is a placebo control group, then you can really miss out on the, uh, the, the you can really miss out on the real effect okay so now let's take a look at this example so we only have an, an empty control group and then we have experimental group right and then so you were looking at their data and you and you're like you you're like oh, okay so they are not really that much different from one another because there is a significant overlap of the error bars right but if you were to add in the placebo control group here in green, then you can see that there's a significant difference between the control, the, the placebo control group and the experimental group. So this effect is what? Well, this effect is the real effect of treatment, all right? Well, as opposed to this effect is the effect of the placebo. Right. And then, so imagine if you do not have a placebo control group, but rather only the empty control group, what you're saying that there is no effect, but in reality, there should be. 
right? So you can so imagine so this in this is the case that you would have made a type two error if you do not have the placebo control group. So in this kind of data, this suggests that there's a significant effect of placebo and there's a significant effect of the treatment, and the placebo effect is intended effect negates each other. Okay, and then the plus, uh, the researchers they would have committed a type two error, and if the placebo control was not used, okay. So now the next thing I kind of want to talk about is why is having a positive control group important? Now imagine this scenario one, okay? So you have a placebo control group. So now we're not using the um, uh, empty control group anymore. We don't care about that anymore. So now let's just take a look at placebo control group. All right? And then now imagine that then you have a uh, experimental group and you have a positive control group. Okay, so the positive control group is there to kind of make sure that what, how well is this treatment doing in comparison to a previously established treatment. So for instance, you are interested in treating ADHD and then, and then you are thinking that, well, this is my new drug, which the experimental group uh, are receiving, are they doing better? Well, but how do I know that how much better they are doing in comparison to the current best drug, let's say Ritalin, okay? And then, so, so when you are developing this new drug, you always wanna compare to a positive control group to make sure how well it is doing in comparison to a previously known effective treatment. Okay, so in this case, uh, this is this kind of data is saying what? Well, this kind of data is saying that what your new drug is doing better from the placebo control group, but it's not doing that much better than the positive control group because when you look at the error bar, there are really there's a lot of overlap from uh, from the experimental group with from the positive control group, okay? Now, this is the kind of data you're kind of looking for when you're developing a new drug. So now, so let's say is if the experimental group is receiving drug, uh, drug X and then the positive control group is receiving Ritalin and so, and, and then the placebo control group is receiving water pill, right? And then so in this case, you can see that there is a huge increase of, you know, there's a huge improvement when, you, when you're comparing the experimental group with the uh, placebo control group. And in, in addition to that, you can see that the experimental group is doing so much better than the positive control group also. So this is the kind of data you, you kind of want. Now, without having a positive control group, you really don't know what is the magnitude of the improvement. You you only know that, oh, okay, there is an improvement, but we don't, we don't know how effective it is. Okay, so this is something, it's always good to have a positive control group when you're doing studies like this to kind of make sure this is the kind of data that you want. Now, now let's say you are seeing this kind of data. So, <clears throat> Scenario three, okay, so there is a placebo control group and you've got a positive control group and now you have an experimental group. Well, what are we seeing? Okay, so we seeing that the positive control group, they did better and then followed by the placebo control group followed by the experimental group. Well, what this is saying is that what your, your experimental group is actually doing much worse, much, much worse than the positive control group and also doing much worse than the placebo control group, right? Now, imagine that if you're looking at an instrument that you really have no idea what the readout means, what well, even seeing this kind of data, it kind of tell you that, well, this drug is not good, it's actually making the patients even worse. So it's always, uh, it, it's really important to make sure that you have a positive control group and, so later on, when you look at these kind of comparison, you have a better idea what is going on when regards to the pattern of data. Okay, now let's talk about extraneous factors. So extraneous factors of are the things that factors other than the intended uh, manipulation can influence the studies dependent variable. So in other words, extraneous factors are, are the anything that can really become like a alternative explanation that explain the differences between your control group and experimental group. So this is threats to internal validity. And the internal validity, so this is the, 
So the internability, we have talked about uh, a lot. And then the next lecture, we're going to uh, uh, devote the whole lecture to it. So this is the, the, the degree to which differences in performance or behavior can be attributed unambiguously to an effect of the independent variable as opposed to the effect of some other uncontrolled extraneous variable. And internally, so in, an internally valid study is free of comp compounds. Well, so you're like, uh, what does that mean? Well, internal validity is basically saying that um, a study that is high in, in internal validity is basically telling you that the only reason that you saw a difference between control group and experimental group, group is because of your manipulation of your independent variable, and that's it. And now if you can find any other alternative explanations that is the that contributed to the difference between um, the control group and experimental group, that is that that study has low internal validity. Okay, so it's very important to make sure that your study is high in internal validity because um, other people can because if, if it's not, then people can say that your entire study is invalid, which is not what we want. Okay, and so basically when you can contribute the differences between the groups and only due to that reason, and you, then your study has high internal validity. Okay, now the next part I kind of want to talk about is the demonstrating statistical significances. So uh, you want to get, get a good idea of what results are mean. So, so you need to do some sort of stats to make sure that the, the differences that you're seeing between the two groups, or well, sometimes three groups, sometimes four groups, this is statistically significant, right? And then this is something that you have should have learned in your statistics class. But basically you are we are trying to say that okay we have enough people in the study and then we have a real effect rather than just um, something that we are really hoping for okay so now the so what is a 95 percent confidence interval well that 95 percent confidence interval is basically telling you that um, your true population uh the, the mean that you got gathered it, within the the true population of the mean should be somewhere between this in this interval okay and then uh and then so basically, it kind of tells you that this is the error bar that, that you have, and then the true mean that you have should be somewhere here, you know, and then and it could be up as, as high as this this place, it could be as low as this place, but it should be it should fall somewhere between it. And there's a 95% confidence that it should be within this bracket, okay? Now the alpha level and p value and the type one error, these are the things that you have learned about about in statistics. If you're not sure what it is, you can look it up in the stats textbook. I'm not going to go over this uh, at this point. Uh, okay, so power. So you want to make sure that are the results not significant because you because your measure was not sensitive enough or is it not uh, because you don't have enough people. Okay, so the power is the ability to detect statistical differences. So basically, the more people that you have in your study, the, 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 the bigger the end you have, the more power that you're going to have. And so the power is kind of very similar to sensitivity, but the differences is that sensitivity is more an experimental term rather than the, the power, uh, rather than power, which is a statistical. Term. And so sensitivity is the way that you can kind of control the variability within your data in your experimental setup. So standardization or having an SOP uh, for this entire experimental setup can really limit the amount of the variability in your data. And this is sensitivity. So, so that means that your data between subjects are going to be, uh, uh, there's going to be very low variability and then what's going to happen is that uh, because of this low variability you need you don't need to have a lot of people in your uh, data set in order to achieve a statistical significance so that's more sensitivity now power is uh, something different power is just purely based on the number of people that you have in the experiment the more people you have in your experiment the more like the, the more powerful your um 
experiment is. Okay, and that's exactly what the what the beta level is. So the beta level is the likelihood of committing a type two error. And then type two error is, of course, you're saying that there is no effect, but in reality there is an effect. So having so if your your study is not very sensitive because you don't have a standard or a standard operation uh, thing, thing procedure and uh, uh, SOP and <clears throat> or if your study is have no standardization, or your study is not well designed, and therefore you have a huge variability, or if your study is recruiting all these diff uh, all these different people from and and that was not very well matched between groups, you are so basically that is going to make sure that your study is not going to be very successful from the beginning. And the only way that you can really kind of um, um, make sure that it's better is by having a lot of people, but then that that is kind of a back, backward ways of doing experiments because you basically you don't want to do any unnecessary work uh, when you don't have to. So it's really important to make sure that the way that you design the experiments are very well done. So you want to make sure that the every everybody gets treated exactly the same and then the way that you're collecting data is the same. And then therefore you can reduce the number that of the people or, or, or sometimes animals in your studies in order to kind of combat that. And then you don't need a huge number of people in order to achieve that statistical significance. Okay, so basically this is kind of just my method of telling you that later on, if you do decide to become a scientist, you want to make sure that the way you design experiments are very, very eloquent. And because if it's not, then you will need to like double your work, sometimes triple your work, sometimes quadruple your work in order to get a lot of people in your data. And then a lot of people with a lot of the N in your data. And then what's going to happen is that it's, it's um, something, a study that could have been done in, in two years becomes a five year, becomes a six year project. And that's, that's not something that we want. Okay. Okay, uh, now when do you use a test? Well, uh, the, the, the time that you use a t-test is when you have two groups. Well, when you have one group that has two conditions, right? So the t-test, you use a t-test independent test when you have two groups, and you use a pair t-test when you have one group that has, that has two conditions, right? And then, so the difference between the one-tail test and the non-directional test, well, so when you use a, a one-tail test, you're basically saying that you have an, a good idea which one, which direction is going to go, okay? And so let's say you are pretty sure that after drinking coffee, after ingesting caffeine, that the reaction is going to go down. Well, if you are very sure of this hypothesis, this is a one-tail um, directional hypothesis, right? So this is when you use a one-tail t-test. Now, when you are kind of saying that, oh, well, I know that the reaction time is going to be different, I don't know if it's going to be faster, I don't know if it's going to be slower, then that's when, when you don't have, I, 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 I only know that there is the, the reaction time will be different, but I don't know in what direction it's going to go. Well, that's when you use a non-directional test. Okay, so that's when you use, so that's the differences. Okay, now one directional test is going to be more powerful because you have, you are kind of saying that this is the only way that it can be different. And then, but you see that one directional test can also give you something called a type three, a type three error, which is when you use correctly stated that there is a significant difference between the two groups, but you are stating the directional differences wrong. So you, so in reality, you correctly identify group A is different from group B, but you are saying that group B is smaller than group A, which is not the case. You, you're saying it's this, but in reality it's this, okay, basically. So that's a type three error. Okay, um, between groups versus within groups. So. Uh, they have commonly used nomenclature between groups. Sometimes you hear them, you hear them as independent groups design, and within groups, sometimes you hear them as repeated measure designs. So these are the other commonly uh, used names. And how many conditions exposed uh, for each other? So between groups, they are only exposed to one condition, and within groups, they're being exposed to multiple conditions. 
Now, which one has more power? Well, the within groups is going to have more power. And the reason is that because whatever they are exposed to in one condition, they're, they're also exposed to the other conditions. And, they, and there is no subject characteristic variability between the conditions as opposed to they have this kind of uh, difficulty when it comes to between groups, uh, right? Because the people who are at, are in group A and group B, they're in, they're in, they're the different groups, right? They're they're the different people, and therefore therefore of course the personality is going to be different, their age is different, maybe their sex is even different, right? And then so this way, uh, but within groups they don't have this they don't have this problem because the subjects are really serving as their own control across um, the conditions. Okay. And so what are some of the necessary precautions to get rid of extraneous variables? So the between groups, you have to kind of make sure that uh, your control group and the experimental group, because they, these are different people at their baseline before you do the manipulation is somewhat comfortable. Because imagine if you are doing some sort of, you know, screwed up as, uh, assignment in which that it's not random, then what happened is that you might have two groups to be very different uh, even from the very beginning. So that's one of the uh, biggest problem when it comes to the between groups design. Now within groups design, you have to, because you don't have problem between this person, because this person is still this person just in different um, conditions, right? But something that you kind of have to make sure is that, um, are there any, what's time passage between this condition versus this condition? So this is something we're going to talk about later in our, uh, in our next lecture. All right, so what are some of the, uh, the designs to avoid? Well, the experimental groups only design, this is of course not good because you want to compare it to a control group. But um, a lot of people, a, a lot of the studies out there actually do this and then, and, and, you're probably thinking, well, why? That's that's so that's so stupid, right? Because it, it has to do with some of the uh, restraints when it comes to the it has to, to, to it has to do with some restraints when it comes to the experimental design, especially with some of the extenuating circumstances that uh, people cannot have like a control group. So let's say if you are trying to study Ebola. Uh, and then you are wondering if uh, if this drug is effective against the people, the patients who are uh, who are infected with Ebola. You know, well, you cannot just have the the control group receiving no drug. You know, that doesn't make sense, and that's not ethical either. Okay, so there, so 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 you need to give every patient some sort of um, effective treatment now. So, so then, then therefore you can only have experimental group only design in this case in your study, and then you need to use this group compare uh, to compare that to a existing data some something that's kind of similar to a benchmark that has already been established in the past. But then the problem with this kind of design is that you're comparing study, you're comparing the data you obtained in your study against the, a, a benchmark that was previously studied, right? And then, but the way that you um, assess these data and versus the way that previous study have assessed like their data, maybe several studies combined together to assess the data, that is there any sort of standardization? Maybe not, okay? So this, uh, but sometimes this kind of experimental group design only is still um, required to do, okay? Now, next one is the non-equivocal um, groups design. All right, so when the experimental group and the, and the control group differ in the characteristic, this is this is something you should never have. Because so imagine if you say you are, your group, your control group are all male and your experimental group are all females, and then well, you know, there's just a sex difference in there already. So this is something you should never have. Okay, where let's like, say your experimental group is all. Uh, young people and your control group is all 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 like aged people. Well, that's not good either. Okay, because uh, because it basically this is not something that you want unless you're studying just the pure effect of aging. All right, so this is um, so you should never have non-equivocal control group design. Okay.
The next one is sometimes uh, you, you can see that one group pretest post test design is a also a problem because sometimes maturation can become a problem, especially let's say you have one group that are that is like young uh, uh, young children, a five year old, and then and you you're saying that okay, I am going to give them like um, a vitamin E, okay, I'm gonna give all of these people vitamin E, and I'm gonna give them for five years, and they're gonna see that if their intelligence improved in five years. Well, then the problem is that where is your where is your match control group? You can, but you can, but but then the researcher says, oh, well, I have a pretest, I have a post test design, so you know, and then I'm just looking at how much they they improve over this time. Well, then the criticism the criticism is that you don't know whether or not that you know just not having not ingesting vitamin E they could also improve by themselves. You can see that. So in this case, in maturation, because uh, they can you can just say that well they could have just gotten smarter by all by themselves without taking this vitamin E, right? So. So you can see that this maturation itself is also a potential problem. So the, this is also a design that you sh should try to avoid. Okay. okay, now with the multiple level experiments, uh, so these are all the terms that you kind of have to know. Uh, so let's just go right into it. Now, so ANOVA, this is the stats test that you should have when you have an independent variable that has more than more than two independent variables. All right. So in other words, so if you let's say if you got three groups of people, then you need to use ANOVA. If you have a groups of two people, then use a t-test, obviously. Okay. Now post hoc is used when you have some sort of um when you have some sort of statistical significance that you got from the ANOVA test. Okay. And then post hoc you only do this after you have a, a you have a significant p-value in the NOVA. And some of the example of post hoc tests that you have you guys know probably pretty well is um, uh, Fisher, Chucky, Dunn, um, multiple t-tests. So these are the ones that are uh, people use a lot. So the one that uh, that I think is the best for uh, our for, for the sake of our studies are, are going to be uh, two key, right? and, th and this is the also the most well known uh, post hoc test. Um, right now, let's take a look at the ANOVA. Okay, and so ANOVA basically kind of you guys remember there is a between group groups variance, right? So this is the extent of the groups mean differ. And so in statistical term, what you have is a, a sum of square of the treatment divided by the degree freedom of treatment, which gives you the mean square of treatment, okay, as opposed to the within groups variance, and you have the sum of square within groups, and then the, uh, the, the, and the degree of freedom within group, and then when you can divide this, then you have a mean square of group. So this is kind of the estimation of the amount of error that is in your data. And then when you take the, the mean of square treatment and the mean square of within group, then you got the F value. So, so then what the F ratio basically tell you is that if your mean square of treatment is very big, and while your mean square uh, of within group is very small, this is going to give you a very big F value. And when the big F, when the F value is very big, then what you're basically seeing, you're seeing a major mean effect. Okay. Now, if the value is not very big, if it's close to one, then you are not going to see a significant effect because that just kind of means that the the mean effect. Uh, the, so, so the mean of square of treatment is kind of similar to the mean square of within groups, uh, which is the error. Okay, so this that's not something that you want when you're trying to look for a mean effect in uh, in the F ratio test. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the parametric versus non-parametric tests. Okay, so parametric tests. Well, so what are parametric tests? Well, so the parametric tests are, let's say, t-test. ANOVA, 
basically. So these are the two parametric tests. And the non-parametric tests are all these things that I kind of listed on here. Now, when do you use a parametric test and when do you use a non-parametric test? Well, the, the parametric test, there are several assumptions that are well embedded within it. So the first assumption is that you have Gaussian curve. Gaussian means uh, um, bell-shaped curve, a normal distribution. Okay, so you can use a normality test to, to make sure that the sample that you are trying to analyze is indeed in a bell-shaped curve. Now, if it's not, then you have to use a non-parametric test. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption is that the, the, the test that you are trying to perform has similar uh, number of people in your test. So your the people that are in your control group and the people that are in your experimental group, the number of people are somewhat comparable. So let's say if you have uh, five people in your control group, but you have 50 people in your experimental group, you should not use a, a, a parametric test. So how do I know what, what is the definition of how what is a comparable? Okay, so the, 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 so the general rule is that one, your, your, your smaller group should not have uh, less than half of your bigger group. So let's say if there are a hundred people in your experimental group, then you need to have at least 51 people in your control group in order to perform a t-test. Now if you don't, then you have to perform a manual review instead. All right, now these are all the parametric versus non-parametric tests in uh, that's kind of similar. So we'll just focus on on, on the last two parts. So when you have like two samples with two conditions, you for the parametric test, uh, the ones that you guys are very familiar with is the t-test with a pair t-test, right? And, but let's say if when you have an equal n, or when you have the non -perm, uh, when you have a non-Gaussian shape curve, then you have to use the net with u instead, okay? And this, instead of using the real data mean, if they use the, 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 the ranking Use the we use a median, okay, and then now similar things with ANOVA. Then the the non-parametric counterpart of that is the Kruskal Wallace, okay, it, which also uses the, the test of uh, median data used on ranking, and then on the, um, factorial ANOVA, then the non-parametric counterpart of that is the Freeman test, and then this uses the test of median uh, again using randomized blocks. Right, so that's basically, uh, make sure that you know this, this is probably going to be an exam question. Uh, so make sure you got this down, okay? Um, okay, so if there are any questions, you can ask this and uh, either post them on the Blackboard in the discussion board, or you can ask me during the Zoom meetings and class is adjourned.